How's it going everyone? Welcome again to another video on the Enterprise UI development. So today is a very interesting day uh, because we attend to an event that is called Ner Nerdiarla. Uh, it's hosted on Buenos Aires. On, it's hosted on Connex. Uh, these uh, what's going to call uh, some sort of cultural place where now big events happen, all right? Uh, at least in Caba, uh, Buenos Aires. So uh, I got a quite harsh opinion about that and uh, because that is something especially in terms of business value in terms of what is the value that you're getting from that you know uh, even though it's more like a utilitarian approach practical and utilitarian approach but in any case um, that doesn't uh, that's not part of the today's video uh, because what we're going to look at this uh, is what is the problem that UI development enterprise UI development solve particularly what are the now as you know how the language works the JavaScript language works uh, and how you can now represent things on the computer as a way to let these machines help you with monotonous task and therefore uh, you can now is starting to well building user interface and how doing that is quite imperative uh, especially uh, because you have to actually tell exactly what to do as a way to build a user interface and how that is something that react is trying to at least promote the solutions by being declarative rather than imperative uh, so we know what is React, what is the value proposition of React, uh, as well as how can we now uh, know how React works behind the scenes, what is the inner mechanism as a way to build this user interface, how then can we now write this user interface in the React way, which means is uh, creating your React components in the most performant way possible, so align to the React guidelines, all right, or to the React physics nature, and as well as how you can make it much more easy to understand now how the data flows through your code base. Like as long as you get some nice auto completion features and starting to realize when it comes to make your UI, your projects uh, be accessible to other developers or to other contributors, how it makes sense to use now TypeScript as a way to define is the intent of this particular code, this UI code. And not only that, when you actually creating all of these different uh, UIs, how it makes sense to actually find a way to keep track at which, what are you showing that to the user? That's when it comes, for example, using things like Redux, okay? This is state management. Uh, and once you know that, which is part of the course that actually, I'm actually uh, I am looking at that, and actually getting some real, uh, and taking notes out of that, is also that how now you can write code that are on this space, how you can create now React application, how you can now create production ready React applications. Okay? Uh, and that means is that, well, there are several tools that we need to understand and to look. Uh, so for example, like tail Tailwinds, as a way to know how can we use tailwinds here and there to actually uh, uh, fix that particular issue uh, or adding the styles and to compose the uh, UI in the most maintainable way possible. So you have now tailwinds uh, as well as TypeScript, as I mentioned before. 
how you can now make this async operations uh, using is a RTK query, all right? Uh, this Redux toolkit development, uh, this development toolkit that allow us is to actually is uh, perform is a async or fetching day so do this data fetching along the way uh, in our applications and how can we keep track the state of that and actually updating the proper user interface that uh, they, the users can or are going to interact with as well as how now especially as you're going to build some another tools like testing as well, something that that's one of the reasons why we're actually going to look at this. Mm -hmm. Most likely because it's like once you are able to build these React UI applications, as well as uh, it'll make sense to know uh, how you can compose and all of this user, uh, all of this UI in your applications and especially as the time move on how you can make that particular code maintainable uh, along for a long period of time uh, when there is a lot of contributors uh, yeah where, where a lot of contributors where a wide range of contributors uh, are or with a, with a large range of contributors in large teams. So the whole point of this is to understand that once you reach to that level, and as I mentioned, by mentioning is all of this series of previous stuff like JavaScript and then React and then what are the tools that we can use with React and then and so for example like TypeScript, Tailwinds, um, unit testing as well as what are the te the advanced techniques that you need to as a way to now deploy these applications on productions and therefore now how you want to make your applications uh, maintainable. All the things that I have mentioned before are part of this better problems you know so as you move down the line or as you keep now understanding more and more uh, of all of the tools that you're doing and what are the problems that they're solved you started to realize that you you have now more problems uh, and more questions uh, about that so that's something interesting because that lead us to the enterprise ui uh, development which is if you are now a lead UI developer, okay, lead senior uh, UI developers, a lot of the time you want to know how to maintain that particular code. Again, this is part of this new set of challenges that you're facing uh, once you now solve previous one, okay? So, how you can make your code maintainable over a long period of time for with a with a with a wide range of contributors in large teams so here we need to understand is what is the problem that we want to solve here on the enterprise ui development and because here we're gonna take a, we're gonna talk about several things like well how we can make comprehensible testing as well as browser-based integrations with uh, Playwright and talking about all of these particular tools and some of the strategy to keep your code maintainable over a long period of time. And what are and what are the process? that we need to actually do as a way to make that happen. So co-automations and automations with GitHub. Uh, and then some recommendations, some proposal as a way to build solid foundations uh, to make the, that happen. But despite that, we need to know what is, uh, first, what is the aim of this uh, course? Uh, as well as what is the problem that we need to solve, right? Or that we are facing that we need to solve. 
So first things first, uh, this course is taught by Steve Keeney. You got it. Head fronting engineer at Temporal, uh, where he previously worked at other companies like Twilo, uh, and then you name it. Uh, and the thing here is that this course is, uh, it, so this course is to build, we're gonna see how to build the infrastructure needed to maintain uh, and manage lower code bases uh, with a, yeah, to manage lower code bases supported uh, by a team of contributors, right? We're gonna talk about is the infrastructure and how to. And that's quite interesting because all of these particular courses is teaching you the how to, right? Uh, and it's up to you to understand what is this? <laughs> what is the problem that is solved? So, well, because at the end of the day, right? Uh, after all of this, right? So the problems uh, that they're trying to solve is that how, as I mentioned before, how can we how can we make our code this thing, whether it is physical or yeah, this thing, okay, material that can be tangible or not, uh, maintainable, durable, or adaptable, okay, over a long period of times when a lot of people with different backgrounds manipulate them all right so it's like a zillions of interactions so the idea of talking about this that i know that it can become quite boring hold on all right stay there is that um it is not boring when you have to actually when you are dealing with this kind of problem it becomes now a pain so that feeling of boringness that we have right now, uh, if we don't pay attention to this, uh, it'll become pain. <laughs> and we know that life is already painful, so we want to at least minimize that, but uh, as long as possible and make it maintainable. So the whole point of this is, is that, is that how can we make our code Pretty much like you have an oven or a kit or yeah, an oven, a motorcycle, a bicycle. Uh, you want to actually make that maintainable uh, over a long period of time, especially if you share that with your little cousin. Okay, so what are the practice and how can we make uh, this uh, maintainable? So. It, and that's the reason why we uh, so we're gonna ask why we have to make our code maintainable why we want to make that bicycle maintainable is for it is usefulness uh, so because when you're going to work with a large code basis uh, uh, you are going to work on older code bases uh, or maybe as you do that, the product direction change based on the CEO, okay? Um, or you want is to now migrate from older frameworks to whatever is hot in these days. And now, uh, perhaps you want to start a new project from the right foot. So if you translate it to the bicycle example, it's like, hey, uh, I find out this older bicycle and I want to now make it useful for me over a long period of time right and especially if I have to share that with some of my family okay so what is the practice how can I make that maintainable okay um so um we need to know what is maintainability here okay so maintainability, broadly speaking, it can be now is whether it is uh, something that you want to make it durable or adaptable, all right? So in the context of code, it's like, hey, is this, can we do things with this stuff, right? Uh, so for example, not only adding code, 
but also can we change something confidently enough uh, yeah with confidence uh, that when we do that we wouldn't break anything or you didn't break anything okay so doing a refactor can we do a refactor without fear can we obey our dependency without fear um that's something interesting okay uh this is now f again i'm talking about the ge the generalizations uh to the specific okay but it's important to you uh now have these generalizations and act accordingly so hey maintainability here is that we want to make this thing durable which means that it's capable of fighting the entropy all right uh, or uh, you want to make these things that instead of doing instead of actually re persist the entropy or resist the entropy adapt to that right uh, that's one of the that's why when we start into having here now more complex problems you know uh, or these better problems is like initially you have now this JavaScript problems as a way to know how you can represent things to the machines okay to do a specific task all right uh, and then you realize hey well what if we want to actually now uh, connect to machines uh, and then provide some sort of interface user interface that now for example we can is buy stuff or sell stuff online you know uh, and then, well, uh, as you figuring out how to do that, how you can create this user interface, then you realize like, oh, but how can we now make this in a more main, in a more easy way, right? So you have now frameworks like Angular or React or uh, Vue, and then uh, you have now this, another question is that, okay, so now that I create this user interface, quite decent fast uh, uh, I want to know how can we is uh, organize manage uh, all of these different UIs especially when I'm going to pass all of this data uh, and not only that when I'm going to build all of this uh, uh, user interface how can we do that in the most performant way so something that is aligned to the to the React framework, to the React nature, uh, and how we can make that easy for us as a way to read that code with TypeScript. So that also leads us is to, great, good. Now we know how to add all of these features and how can we make our, how can we create is production great React applications, right? Uh, for example, to sell stuff online. But at the end of the day, it's like, how can we then make this thing maintainable? I know, I'm quite repeating here, but the idea here is to recognize that each one of those phases, and if you can use my way of explaining to, if you can mock up myself of how I explain this kind of thing, as a way to, for you to understand what are the problems that we're facing? Uh, a lot of the time, it'll make sense. Uh, so you're free. Feel free to do that. Feel free to do that. Okay. Um, that's quite interesting. That's that's powerful. That's better. So, um, all right. Good. 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 So how, how now can we integrate all of this, right? You may wonder, so why we, so after all, um, that we talk about is what is the end goal of the, uh, uh, what is the end goal to make this code basis maintainable uh, over a long period of time with a wide range of developers or contributors in large teams, uh, by understanding now is uh, what is the problem that we are solving here uh, and that is how can we make this thing this code durable or adaptable okay we can talk about it in, in those terms right most likely is 
adaptable, right? Because we are working with software, this thing, uh, it'll make more sense that this adapt to, uh, to the entropy, to whatever is trying to um, erode that. So uh, we need to also talk about what is uh, main, what is, um, we all know what maintainability means in the back end, right? Most of the time we have the, an idea of what is that. It's like, well, we can now is uh, make change to the scale base and also when we want to scale that to make it easy. So uh, there's a lot of developers actually hammer. There will be a lot of users hammering the database and you want to actually is now replicate that data or uh, create more instance of that data and that kind of thing. But for the front end, it's like, how you can now make this scalable, right? Uh, and maintainable. Uh, how you can because at the end of the day uh the user just don't know that piece of code on the browser and then um that's it you can is serve that content to millions of users uh and that won't impact that much the front end what will impact is the way of how you're going to how fast can you deliver features relevant features uh, as well as um, how yeah how, how confident you can make your your code how confident can you update dependencies or do a refactor without fear or feeling confident enough to do that or with confident enough to know that you're not going to break something right so because of that those ingredients needed as a way to make the maintenance of a code base um uh, durable or um adaptable all right for it is economic uh, purpose uh, for a, a benefits that we're getting right uh, we need to actually build is an infrastructure. We need to actually build some sort of operations or some sort of basics installations that allow us to uh, operate this, that allow us to change, uh, change the code base as well as, uh, yeah, that allow us to change or add new features to the code base, update that without any fears, do some code refactors as well. Uh, whatever uh, we are working, whether it's, this is a legacy application that we're working, or if we need to actually change the project directory here, there's a way to add new features and change that, uh, or adding new features to that. Or perhaps you want is to now is um, to migrate a, to whatever f new f hot framework is. So from the older frameworks to whatever hot uh, is, uh, yeah, to, to whatever framework, to whatever framework, uh, to whatever framework is hot these days, right? Or you want to start uh, with the right foot. So all of this, so by understanding is the infrastructure and the infrastructure is for a military purpose uh, that comes from the etymology, uh, online, a website, a team all on, online, a team, all, a team all online, all right, get with it, is that, all right, this particular word, infrastructure, uh, it's come from the French word, 1887, uh, that is, well, these basic installations needed for these operations to function, okay? Uh, and when it comes to define that uh, the infrastructure uh, right now, is like, yes, that is the basic installations needed uh, for uh, it is economic, for it is, for it is economy to function for households, 
uh, or firms, right? So all of this that we're talking about, right? So the maintenance of this particular code base, uh, which is how can we make now our code durable or adaptable and adaptable, both of them. How can we make our code durable and adaptable uh, for its economic purpose uh, in a way that allows us to do, in a way that allows us to add in so add new change uh, or refactors and do updates or start with the right foot. Uh, what are the ingredients needed as a way to lay out this? What is the infrastructure needed for that? And Steve Keeney used this particularly pyramid, uh, uh, Mashallah pyramid, all right, as a way to well lay out at least a foundation or have a visual representation of this is like you need to start first with the system and the system the word system system etymology all right the word system okay uh the whole creation the universe from late Latin sistema, an arrangement system. So how can we now is, so exactly, how, we need to create now is an arrangement of elements here or, or our operations here, a system uh, from Greek sistema, organized whole, a whole compound of part from steam to cisnistanai, uh, to place together, organize, form, okay, from Greek, sistema, organize, whole, a whole compound of part, from steam of systenai, to place together, organize, from, in order, from cis, to, uh, from cis, together, ah, that's interesting, cis, or sin, together, uh, root from, Istania cause to stand uh, from by root to stand to make or be firm. The notion is a combination exactly because all of these are notions. This is not certainty. <laughs> it's just notion that we want to describe and we want to transfer to others as this word. A combination of assemblage of part of things forming or adjust as a regular and connected whole, right? But it's this combinations of assembling parts uh, forming, uh, or when you connect that, form a whole. So the meaning is uh, the set of correlated principles, facts, idea, etc. Uh, it's a test by 6030, the meaning animal body of an organized whole. Uh, animal body of an organized whole, some of the vital process in an organism, right? Is recorded hence uh, that if you really get something, get something out of one system, a test by 900. If 1680, as a group of body moving together in space, uh, bound by law of dynamics, as the sun and it is planets. The computer sense of group of re related programs is recorded from 1963, all system goes. In 1962, uh, it's from US space programs. The system prevailing social order is from 1806. All system goes in 1960. Uh, the computer sense of group of related programs. Uh, but this is interesting. Again, again uh, the whole point of this is the whole creation of this arrangement of element that they create now as a whole this, right? Um, so the, it is quite interesting because it's sometimes quite hard to start with the system, all right? 
uh, because, well, you need to at least know all of these different things that we need to do, or all of these different components that we need to do. Uh, as a way to then identify that this belongs to a system, right? That's perhaps my goal. But in any case, uh, how you can now hear uh, on the UI development, what are the ingredients that allow us to now make this code maintainable over a long period of time uh, with a wide range of contributors in large teams? So the ingredients uh, that we need to is we need to place system here. We need to define what are the different components that when together actually allow us uh, to do things that form something. It is interesting because they don't talk about it only it is functionality, right? Uh, they don't talk about this only it is functionality. Uh, and I think this is something important and valuable for that is this arrangement of parts that makes it as a whole. But again, all of this arrangement of parts that makes it as a whole, what is the purpose? You know, in this case, make the code maintainable. In this case, make that thing suitable or adaptable, right? Which means that this will end. <laughs> so if you're trying to do something that is durable or adaptable, and then you have to now fight law of nature, or then you're trying to align to the law of nature, like entropy, and we don't know why or how or how to align to that in a way that we, and even though we haven't clarified what entropy is, I mean, we specify that in an equation, but if we don't know how to prevent that, uh, it's like we're, we are knocking our head on a wall uh, until we find out the answer. <laughs> so at the end of all of this is that uh, this maintainability, yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty fun. Uh, this maintainability, Okay, so this maintainability, uh, which is this durability, or yeah, this durability, oh my god, this durability uh, or adaptability uh, is something that uh, is uh, is like a raised arm, you know, raised arm. Mm -hmm. So there is no no ending. There is no ending. Okay. Um, maintainability. You have the co co maintainability. Is. Uh, is like an arms race. Yeah. Coming in a bit is like an arms race. There is no, there is no end. There is no finish line. Coming in a bit is like an arms race. There is no finish line. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, because there is no end, <laughs> uh, and even though we have we have this problem in our faces, we have to do something about it, right? Um, and that is. Setting some systems, right? Setting some arrangement of things that we need to do uh, as a way to now uh, uh, for for a goal, right? 
So you have your systems or your protocols. So system here is like, well, the unit testing or the testing uh, infrastructure needed, uh, the static analysis, uh, as well as the build system, okay? Uh, and the other is that on top of that, you will have now is the process. Well, the process, it will tell you now is, okay, now that you identified that you need this infrastructure or this system with a goal, all right, how are you going to do that? What are the process that you're going to do? And I really, I want to make a, I want to hit the break here, uh, for example. If your goal, all right, is to, um, yeah, if your goal, all right, uh, if your goal is to, for example, um, yeah, uh, all right, so if your goal, for example, So if your goal, for example, is to lose weight or maintain your physical, your health, you now identify what is the end goal, and then you need to define what are the process that you need to. And by identifying the goal, you can actually use that as part of your system. So hey, I want to maintain is my health. Okay, I want you now maintain is uh, this body composition. I want to do that because uh, this is my system for health or physical health. Okay, uh, the question is that what are the things that I need to do? How to do that? And that's when it comes the process. It's like, hey, well, you need to uh, uh, go to the bed early. Uh, Eat at a particular hours, do some fasting, uh, perhaps calculating is uh, your calorie intakes. That's another thing, uh, as well as your protein protein intake, uh, as well. Right, and as you do this, you are going to now identify areas of things that you need to do and how to do right uh, followed by a, a patterns uh, here I, I don't know I don't I don't find what is the definition oh yeah because system tells you what it is and process tells you how to do okay I want to know is the perplexity let me ask perplexity about uh, what is the difference what is the difference the difference between okay, what is the difference between uh, process and patterns? So between uh, systems, systems, or system process and pattern, right? exactly have a purpose each system has a defined purpose of function it has it is boundaries uh, a process uh, it involves the activities the inputs and outputs uh, and the structure and the patterns is a reusable solutions to a recurring problem okay if you find now this is something that happened, uh, yeah, if you have now this problem that happened over and over and over and over and over, and a pattern is a reusable solution of a recurring problem according to you. Mm -hmm. where, where does the definition come from? Where did the, the, the pattern definition come from? Gigs for gigs. Uh, and patterns for IT process. Okay, okay. 
Okay. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense. So the system has a goal here. Okay. It's a set of different components related to each other for a goal. The other is a process. Uh, the process is indicating is that how you're going to do that. Okay. Uh, and this, how you're going to do, uh, it is based on patterns that happens uh, or problems that, or yeah, the patterns that have the problems that happen over and over in a recurring way. And then you want to come up with some pattern. And then you want to come up with some pattern, with some solution, reusable solution for a recurring problem. Uh, okay, uh, let me actually ask this to uh, Claude to see what is, as well as the OpenAI. OpenAI. Uh, yeah, that's right. Why you're not? There you got it. Is that the system focus on what it is and the end goal process on a concentrate on the step yeah process on how to how to do that and patterns is that repeated things that happen uh, repeated uh, yeah recurring problems recurring things that happen and then we can use now a solution on that Okay, and I need this definition. So system means so system uh, means what it what is what it does what it does. Okay, system means what it does. Okay, system means what it what does it what does it. Okay. A system. What? Come on, man. Stop this. System means what it does. Okay. What it do. Exactly. So system mean what it does. What it does. Okay. So system mean what it does. All right. Uh, process means uh, how to do that. So what it does. Okay. What what it does. Uh, how to do how to do that okay is that how to do that and now uh, patterns are recurring problems are recurring recurring things recurring things okay so how to do that and uh, what are the recurring things? 
okay so understand this okay so what are the recurring things that we do right so understanding now the system that they have a goal which is hey we want to have a system a testing system we want a static analysis we want to also have a build system and then the process on that uh which is uh hey how we gonna do our uh, testing okay uh which is a unit testing and integration testing yeah how how we gonna do this uh, as well as the co-review uh, blueprints and design documents uh, followed by the patterns right so what are the recurring themes that we do in these cases the architecture the state management and the patterns uh, it, it makes it makes quite a lot of sense here uh, yep. uh, architecture state management and abstractions no and abstractions uh, yep and abstractions so all of this is just to lay out the foundation of what are the things that we need to do as a way to make our code maintainable right we need to lay out the systems for a goal, in this case, hey, we need to actually define some testing uh, system here, as well as some static analysis here, as a way to, hey, to know that this data actually have the data that it needs to. And also, how are we going to now build this, okay? Uh, in terms of uh, build uh, the applications, okay? Each one of them has a particular goal, and the promise it tells you how to do that, right? So, hey, what are the things that you need to do for each one of them? Hey, you're going to do some code reviews uh, for uh, testing. Um, uh, you're going to do is now some uh, blueprints uh, when it comes to a static analysis uh, or build system. You have now templates of that uh, followed by design documents. No, I, I respect that. I respect that. I truly respect that. Uh, so, all right. Uh, there you got it, right? So what are the tools that we're going to use in this course? Well, it's something that we already know. It's like React, TypeScript, Testing Library, VTest, and Blade Right. Right? Okay. So we're going to start now with this. And I want to now... Uh, here how it actually lay out this it lay out for the system or the testing library or I mean the system uh, as a way to make this application uh, easy to test or to run some tests that actually works as expected so the system uh, the testing system uh, also the build that okay so the testing here, uh, when it comes to the unit testing, uh, as well as to component testing, all right? Accessibility testing, okay, I'm building a CI pipeline here, part of the build system, uh, integration with testing, and enforcing a standard. And I think that this particular course Focus more on the testing and code quality. Yeah, it focus more like in testing. Yeah, it focus way much more in testing. Exactly. It focus more on the testing infrastructure. Uh, and build system. No, but it's more like. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. So it's focused more on that, right? 
so the end goal of this is more like more like that okay let's get into this all right okay mm. uh, let me actually bring some water Okay, the basic of unit testing, right? So the basics of unit testing. Okay, it makes a lot of sense to actually understand what is the problem that we're solving completely. Uh, we will. As you can kind of guess from the preamble, the majority of our time together is kind of on that systems piece. And like, yes, could you write build processes for all sorts of things? Sure. But like the lowest common denominator of the thing that you should be automating is likely and enforcing is likely does your application work, right? Once you have like hit that like level of the hierarchy of needs, you can move up to other ones like is the title of their pull request formatted in a way that automatically closes the JIRA ticket. Like, when you're solving those kinds of problems, like, I love it. But like, you gotta, you gotta solve the baseline problems first, right? Um, so, the problem with talking about testing is that, like, we need to at least spend a few minutes together coming up with what is going to be, like, in our time together, our language of testing, right? Because there are a lot of terms, those terms mean things, and we, use them wrong all the time, and most of these terms have been used wrong so much that sometimes the wrong way is more important than the right way. So most of like the first like section is like, let's get on the same page when I say words, what they mean, um, and then we'll get kind of comfortable with the very basics of some of the tools that we're going to use. Um, disclaimer, these are my definitions, and since I'm going to do the majority of the talking, uh, just so you, you know, we have a common frame of reference to the things that I'm saying. Um, these are not the uh, these do not represent the opinions of my employer or anyone else in that matter, particularly any on anyone on Twitter. All right, uh, don't at me. Um, there is a wide range of tests. They have different sets of trade-offs. Anyone that um, it's not fair. I would be hesitant to say like it should be. These are the best kinds of tests. There are trade-offs, right? Like at my very scientific diagram here, you can see that like you've got on one end unit tests. You know what's cool about unit tests? They run really fast, right? Like sometimes like if you have the right editor plugin, they'll like run in your editor and put a red squiggly line or something like to the, like, the left on the sidebar almost immediately, right? It's, you know, a lot of these are like put two things in function, see if the thing you expected to come out came out, right? Uh, that's really easy to run. Like V8, super good at that kind of stuff. 
Uh, that said, they are testing to see if you put two things into the function, did the thing you expect to come out come out? And that's, yeah, we would like to know that. that that's great to know that. But you know who's not doing that? Your customers. They are clicking buttons, right? Usually in the most hostile way that they possibly can. Uh, they are clicking buttons from the web browser. So all the way on the other end, we've got spin up a browser and pretend to be a user clicking buttons. Arguably, if you've got like really good tests in this sense, right, that are doing all the things and exercising your application, you can be super confident that you didn't break anything. That said, as you are like writing code, you're probably not running these all the time, right? Because like spinning up the browser, navigating across, hitting the buttons, like it's not slow, but it's not fast either, right? And sometimes you think about like, what is the feedback loop that you have? And if you can get immediate feedback that the thing you did was bad, Exactly. Then you can make the next decision, because we right? If you have to wait four minutes every time you make a decision, uh, the number of thoughts you could have in a day is way low, right? And so there might be people say like, oh, if it's covered by this test, you shouldn't have the test. I don't believe these people. Sometimes I want to know real fast. Sometimes I want to know real confidently. And I'm willing to wait a few minutes, right? These are both fair things. And like sometimes maybe I have two tests of different kinds covering relatively the same functionality um, because I'm two different people. I am both the person on call sometimes, and sometimes I'm the person like trying to write some code, right? And those two people have different needs. And so sometimes I will break the rules and have different kind, you know, this different kinds of tests testing the same thing. And I think that that's totally okay. And, and we'll talk about the one in the middle when I get to the slide. Want to lay out the fundamentals um, which like I said, you can test small as possible testing it away with. Um, which are and we get, we get back what we expect. Sure that, that's a joke. Or we make, which that's the only pun that make I'm making sure intentionally. There it was. Marking on yeah, mark sure time. And then, we go. then on the other end of the spectrum, there are end to end tests. I mean real end to end tests. Like true end to end tests. Right? Like what we have different kinds, you know, the um Exactly. So, so to be on the same page, we need to lay out, we need to define some common concepts, right? A lingua franca. So, like you tested. The small possible test that you can get away with is hand some arguments to a function and check to see if uh, we got to check if we if we got uh, back what we expected, right? But the the idea is uh, unit testing is uh, test uh, yeah unit testing small small test uh, to your functions to check that they got what we expected. Okay. <clears throat> like I said, you can test the smallest possible testing it away with, um, and we get back. Then on the other end of the spectrum, there are end-to-end -end tests. I mean real end-to-end -end tests, like true. Exactly. And and tests, right? Then like testing everything from like test. the back end to uh, like off a whole like is, soup to nuts, uh, uh, kicking the tires on your application. These are great. User experience. These are wonderful. I have never seen these in the wild. It is right uh, because there's a lot of infrastructure, and particularly on the front end team, you probably don't control a lot of it, right? So, for instance, to have a true end to end test, you need the ability to like. Spin up a brand new user with a certain like, like settings like whether or not they are a pro user and have a credit card in there, whatever, and then tear down that user, right, uh, and get everything back, you know, to exactly the way that it was, right. Um, there's lots of reasons why you don't have this. Like, you know, when I worked at a uh, certain company that sent emails, like what we had was a pool of test users. So like only one, like test runner could be running at a time because of two tried to use the same user, they would both fail and probably leave that user in an unknown state and then your test would just break for perpetuity. Right? Not great. Um, you know, a lot of times you can't really test truly against production because like, especially like, you know, when I worked for a public company, like things that like made the data not real were bad. Right? So there's all sorts of reasons why true spin up a brand new database end to end doesn't exist. Uh, a lot of times even at a large enough company, spinning up everything 
on the fly is not a thing that you can do. Right? And if you can, like we aspire to do it at Temporal, but like we can get away with stuff open source, we own the server, so on and so forth. Right? We still don't have it. Uh, but we're aspiring to do it. But generally speaking, this is the ideal. Um, but also you can imagine these are expensive and they are slow. So they come with some stuff in the middle. Then we have the word integration test. This is the most hand wavy definition that we're going to talk about today. Uh, integration test is like one or more units, right? Which is like almost everything, right? After like the very put two things in a function, look at the return result, right? Like, um, I, you know, we will kind of, um, for our, we're gonna, these are, we're gonna use this to refer to our like spinning up Playwright or Cypress, something that's like kicking the tires on our app in the browser, even if we have to mock out some of the APIs or something along those lines and kind of like have it work in there. We're gonna call those integration tests because they are like testing to see of all of our components when we slap them all together in that UI. Do they all act together nicely the way that they should? Is that truly an integration test, I guess? Are some of a unit tests maybe technically integration tests? Sure, I don't care. Um, that's going to be the term we use because I believe, in my experience, that is generally our like at least as far as yeah, we're going to save this term for a type of test where we spin up a browser and poke our entire application from the user perspective. Okay, we're just going to pretend like these are the end-to-end -end tests. Okay, we are going to pretend we are just going going to pretend why we did like this are end to end tests as are agree upon agreed upon uh terms i'm sure that someone will grab a time machine from the early 80s and tell me that i'm wrong i don't care uh, lastly, component test, which is a totally made up term, which is those tests somewhere in the middle. Don't visit an entire page, but like maybe, you know, maybe grab me that accordion and we uh, open and close it a few times. Maybe we uh, fill in some fields on that form of just that form component and see if the button is enabled or disabled, right? Like these are somewhere in the middle of our very small unit tests for like utilities or just JavaScript functions and our browser based ones. Uh, these live kind of in the middle. They are faster than spinning up Playwright, um, but don't give you the same amount of confidence as like literally just visiting the page, stuff along those lines. As we know, CSS is a thing, right? Um, and like the box model is a thing, and like how a component operates when you like render in isolation is different than when you put it in a flex box or something along those lines, right? And so, and like how a component operates when you like render in isolation is different than when you put it in a flex box or something along those lines, right? And so you these are a healthy trade-off. Um, and on any given application, you can dial in how you feel about this. I've seen applications where it's a lot of component tests. Uh, I've seen applications where prior to testing library, we installed Enzyme. We installed it. There is probably component tests in there somewhere. Right, um, you know, you can kind of choose your own adventure with this. It's about like what works for you and your team. My job is to kind of like at least show you how to set these things up, like kind of take you through the paces of like what's effective where, what helps to deal with like what you want to do, so on and so forth. And like sometimes, like how can we abuse some of these tools to get test coverage when we don't have any? Right, like maybe that's a playwright test that like exercises your entire application. Cool, at least you got that. Maybe it's like hey, you know that function that nobody really knows what it does and has no test, we just know that we don't want it to change? Like, maybe that's a place for snapshot tests, despite what you read on the internet about how snapshot tests are bad, right? <laughs> I don't know how it gets these outputs, but like, just throw a bunch of stuff at it and verify that it didn't change, mm -hmm. right? Like, I copy and pasted a bunch of API, you know, responses into a JSON file, shove them all in, and make sure what comes out the other end is the same. That's in a messy code base. Somebody's got to do what you got to do. Hmm. Interesting, okay. With that said, I, we could start from the playwright test and work our way down. It seems like just for our own happiness that we'll kind of start at the bottom with unit test and work our way up. Okay. Basic unit testing. That is a types of tests. Right. Dun, 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 dun. Guys, this yeah type of test 
Okay. All right. And then you got now set up unit testing with VTest. Set up unit unit testing with VTest. This is actually quite simple, you know. Um, okay. Again, I'm not gonna. This is not a unit testing your first layer of defense because remember, remember that after all, okay. Uh, what we're doing here, remember the end goal of this, is that, well, we want to now make this code maintainable, durable, and adaptable, right? So for that, we need to define some systems, some um, th uh, a range of things that we need to do for a goal, which is... Uh, to make first initially to make our code works which is with testing hey our code is working as suspected makes sense makes sense we're gonna, we'll, we'll talk about unit testing. testing this is we're, we're not going to go all the way into the weeds we're not going to do the thing we're like let's write our own uh, testing, testing framework we're going to kind of like run a few simple ones to make sure that everyone's set up but we'll, we'll talk about unit testing this is we'll kind of start at the bottom with unit test and work our way up um, again I'm not gonna this is not a we're gonna, we'll talk about unit testing. This is we're not going to go all the way into the weeds. We're not going to do the thing. We're like, let's write our own uh, testing framework. We're going to kind of like run a few simple ones to make sure that everyone's setup works and that we're all on the same page with like Vitest and stuff like that. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about some of the more advanced techniques that have been helpful to me when uh, refactoring code, uh, and then kind of use that as our first foray into building up a build process that runs the aforementioned tests and make sure everything works the way that we think it does. Okay. Yeah, okay. We'll, that, 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 that's, that's a lot. So slow uh, down. Testing framework. We're gonna kind of like slow down. It's more s. Oh. Oh, that's a big. Okay. Not gonna, this is not a. We're gonna. We'll talk about unit testing. This is. We're not gonna go all the way into the weeds. We're not gonna do the thing. We're like, let's write our own uh, testing framework. We're gonna kind of like run a few simple ones to make sure that everyone's set. Exactly. And I really love about this. Here here what we are going to do is well here what we're going to do is to write some simple okay so, so yeah set up uh, set up your uh, test environment okay, environment okay write some simple uh, test. All right. That up works, and then we're all on the same page with like by tests and stuff like that. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about some of the more advanced techniques that have been helpful to me when uh, refactoring code. Mm hmm. Okay. Some advanced techniques uh, for refactoring code. Uh, and then kind of use that as our first foray into building up a build process that runs the aforementioned tests and make sure everything works the way factoring code. Uh, and then kind of use that as our first foray into building up. First foray. First foray. What in the F? First foray. Oh, foray. For is this for a means that, bro? Well, interesting. Incursion. How do you say now excursion? You know, that's very interesting. Excursion. Uh, trip. Round. Walk. Ride. Stroll. Promenade. Tour excursion. Mm. That's interesting. That's very, very, very interesting. Hmm. A build process that runs helpful to make sure that everyone's okay. setup works and that we're all on the same page with like by tests and stuff like that. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about some of the more advanced techniques that have been helpful to me when uh, refactoring code, uh, and then kind of use that as our first foray into building up a build process that runs the aforementioned tests and make sure everything works the way. Oh, okay. So, and then, 
then build uh, and then go into our first first foray first foray yeah into our first foray into our first foray uh, to set up a build process except to set up a build process to make sure everything works uh, and then kind of use that as our first foray into building up a build process that runs the aforementioned tests. The affirmation, exactly. And then then go into the first foray to set up a build process that run that affirmate and interesting. Affor affirmate. Affirmate. Oh, I for me. That's one of the reasons why I actually hear this kind of thing. Uh, refactoring code, uh, and then kind of use that as our first foray as into building up a build process build that runs the affirmation test. Affirmation. A for mention. Hmm. A previous, the affirmation. Uh, la ponencia. The affirmation. This particular words is something that I'm going to use a lot. <laughs> right. Yep. You completely. Wrong. I don't know if you are able to see this. This affirmation word. Affirmation. Affirmation. Aforementioned. 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 Mm-hmm. Previously mentioned it, aforementioned it. I really love it. Lo que ya he citado previamente, lo que ya he citado previamente in Spanish. Uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, that's very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Aforementioned. Aforme Affirmation. Mm -hmm. Affirmation. 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 Aforementioned. Aforementioned. Exactly. Mm, that's very, very, very. So then we're gonna run in. Then we're gonna run into our first foray to set up a build process that run that aforementioned. That run that affirmation test. I love this. I love this. To run, uh, yeah, that that runs. That runs the affirmation. That run the affirmation test and make sure that everything works as expected. Exactly. And make sure everything works as expected. Right? Makes a lot of sense. And make sure everything works the way that we think it does. Mm, and I think this is quite interesting because this is the roadmap. As a way to now is deal with the first things that we need to do, especially uh, if you need to actually is set up a testing system, right? If you want to now make this code maintainable uh, over a long period of time, right? At least right now we are using is this testing infrastructure, testing system to make the to that allow to to know if our code work as expected.
period. And for that, we're going to see here is, well, the basic of the unit testing, which is something that I already mentioned. Uh, that is, well, you have now unit testing as a way to test your functions in isolation, right? And you have now on, this, on the other screen is the end-to-end -end testing, uh, which is now testing the entire UI, UX experience. That's actually something slow and very expensive because a lot of the time you don't own a lot of the infrastructure uh, when you do that. Uh, and then you have now the integration testing, which is somewhat the way we're going to do as our end-to-end, -end, as A or E2E, uh, which is this end-to-end. -end. And uh, the whole point of this is then recognize and then do something more, then do something like component testing, which is the way of how now you can is um, Uh, ba, 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 ba. Yeah, the, the, so we need to actually instead of instead of testing our uh, functions, uh, we need to actually test our components to actually show that hey, that component actually sh uh, uh, work as expected, not only in terms of the data that re it receives, uh, but also as, as well as the layout and how that behave as it is. Uh, and then we're going to see now is a more practical approach, which is this uh, uh, unit testing. Uh, where here we're gonna do is well, this to do list. Um, mm -hmm. mm. Okay, it's, it's lack of incentive. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, here, yeah, just want to look at this setup environments and then write your, um, yeah, write some simple tests for that. We're going to deep dive into that. We're going to get into the weeds of this. Some advanced techniques for refactoring code that have helped is um, Steve Keeney along the way. Uh, and then how we're we gonna do our first forage into to set up the build process using GitHub Actions, okay? Uh, to run the affirmation test and make everything work as expected. All right. If you have never seen a unit test before, or like you just wanna make sure that we're on the same page, this is like a pretty good example. Um, we have a completely worthless function called add, it takes two arguments and it uses plus sign. Um, <laughs> you know, there's probably a lot more tests that we would have to write because JavaScript, as you know, true plus true equals two. Uh, the string one plus one equals 11. I don't even remember what happens in the other way because I don't have to because I use TypeScript and I know that A and B will be numbers. Um, and like, I know that it will return a number. So an entire set of tests that I don't have to write anymore. Um, but I can have this one ridiculous one down here, which is it should correctly add two numbers. Clearly there's nothing checking for, for typos. Um, but like, we have an expect statement that exercises the function, and then we verify that it is um, the answer that we expect, right? Like, you could use assert. You, there are various different ways to um, expect or assert that things are what you think they are. They don't really matter that much. Whichever one makes you happiest. Uh, I liked assert for the longest time, but I lost that war because uh, nobody agrees with me. And assertion is just basically, or expectation is like, hey, I'm expecting this. If it's not, throw an error. All, and I'm going to repeat this about three more times over our time together. All a test runner does is runs your code and assert or an expectation or expect, throws an error if it's not what you expect. All a test runner does is collect those errors and tell you about them at the end instead of blowing up after the first one. That's all the unit test runner is. You could write one yourself. You shouldn't. You could. Um, test is just making the code do and tell you about them at the end instead of blowing up after the first one. That's all the unit test runner. Assert or an expectation or expect throws an error if it's not what you expect. All a test runner does is collect those errors and tell you about them at the end instead of blowing up after the first one. Mm-hmm. Okay, so assertion what we do is is to collect. What the fuck is this? 
All right, so this is assertion here. Mm -hmm. uh, so assertions are uh, things that I really like to be true and she'll totally throw an error if that's not the case. So assertions, so assertions here works by collecting all of, all of the errors. Okay, all of the errors and then throw it away throwing away and then throwing away if there are any ones run all the tests really hmm that's all the unit test runners you could write one yourself you shouldn't you could um exactly that's what that's what tests runners are doing makes sense okay test is just making the go do things um like i said the test runner keeps track of it all a test suite is just a pretentious way to refer to a javascript file with a bunch of tests in it um that runs through it all and we'll know awesome so what we're going to do now is we're going to go and we're going to just like run some tests and see some and just look at the tool that we're going to be using uh, for both unit testing and component testing. One, if you've never used iTest or even just before, like maybe you're using Mocha, um, just to make sure that like we're all like on the same way of testing. So suite is just a pretentious way to refer to a JavaScript file with a bunch of tests in it um, that runs through it all and we'll know. Awesome. So what we're going to do now is this pretentious way to refer to a JavaScript file with a bunch of the as this collect those errors and tell you about them at the end instead of blowing up after the first one. That's all the unit test runners. You could write one yourself. You shouldn't. You could. Um, test is just making the code do things. Um, like I said, the test runner keeps track of it all. A test suite is just a pretentious way to refer to a JavaScript file with a bunch of tests in it um, that runs through it all, and we'll know. Awesome. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go and we're going to just like run some tests and see some and just look at the tool that we're going to be using uh, for both unit testing and component testing. One, if you've never used iTest or even just before, like maybe you're using Mocha, um, just to make sure that like we're all like on the same wavelength, we'll go take a look at the tests and run some and give it give it a sense. If you try to run, just a tasting note on the repo, if you try to run NPM test from the very top level, it will yell at you. You just need to go into one. Okay. One of the examples and run it from there. They started releasing an excuse to see if you set up works. Mm -hmm. A source example getting started. Oh, source examples. Source examples. A synchronicity, character search, counter, fist bus, break expectation, obscure course, packet, packing leech, packing leech, paralyzed test, paralyzed test, sign up, snapshot test, test context. Okay. And it should be good to go. Um, so, yeah, like make sure you navigate into source examples, getting started, and try out both MPM test oh. and MPX, MPX by test, which you can totally run from the top level, just don't. Um, and one, what I would love in this quote unquote exercise is if it's not working for you, we should deal with that now. Otherwise, it'll be a long day. So, it's using an excuse to see if your setup works. Okay. Head into the source uh, example, getting started, and run the following commands here. All right, uh, see you with it, sir. There you got it. Gladly. Mm hmm. Now it's here. Got it. Now it's here. Let's run the master. Okay, make there. Uh, because now we are getting to the wits. Uh, unit testing. You enterprise UI development, you know, the enterprise UI development. Okay. Testing and code quality. Mm -hmm. This is testing and code quality. This is one of them. 
It's not involving into any of the weeds of the DevOps and build steps and what you gotta do, okay. See the enterprise UI development. Okay, go quality and we're gonna clone this, this one. Do, do, do. There you got it. Hey, get clone this, please. Will you? That's right. And then we head up to source. And then we head up to source. Okay. Source. And examples here. And well. I want you to now open this as it is a bring working directory. As a way to navigate to that room. Okay. Open folder. Can I put here? Why why not man? Why you so obnoxious when it comes to actually me change this? That's something that I really don't like about this. Hmm. Anyway, uh, enterprise here. So source examples. There you go. All right. Holy moly. <laughs> so we'll take a look at that. But yeah, go ahead and run the test, and we'll take a look at a few of them, and we'll, we'll talk about them. But let's make sure everything works before we get in too deep. So the question was, we're going to use Happy Dom uh, with uh, Byte Test. Um, so let me like start by answering what happy DOM is. Uh, your tests run in Node, right? Mm -hmm. Things that Node does not have: a window object, a document object, you know, anything that is in the browser, right? It's just running JavaScript. Happy DOM and its older sibling, JS DOM, are basically uh, spec compliant um, implementations of the DOM API in Node. So then like you can go document.body and you can deal with DOM nodes and stuff along those lines and it will all just work even though you don't have a real DOM. And uh, Happy DOM is a fast, light way, uh, way of dealing with that. Um, I, the origin story for those of you who care, is I started out using Happy DOM and then I had like one edge case where like Happy DOM didn't like update when the run button was enabled or disabled and I lost half a day of my life. On a whim, I switched out to JS DOM and it worked. <laughs> so that informs me. I use Happy DOM at work and I've never had a problem with it, but in this workshop, it's very JS DOM. But other than one tiny edge case, you can use whichever one makes you happier. Mm. That was an unintended pun. Um, but like generally speaking, I'm going to go with JS DOM because of like one edge case a bit me, but like that also informs, that tells you a little bit of who I am as a person. All right, so going into source. But like spiritually, we'll use a DOM abstraction, just not happy DOM for reasons. And getting started, and then cool, I'll open it up in code, and I should have just done the entire thing, but here we are. And so in here, I can run npm test, and it will run my tests, right? And we'll see everything like this. If this looks like Jest to you, because uh, you've used Jest, yep, it does look like Jest. Um, one thing to note is that it drops into this watch mode automatically uh, as soon as you run the tests. Uh, you can type in Q to leave that, or you just hit Control C, like everything in the terminal. You can hit H for a bunch of options that we'll kind of talk a little bit about later. But you can run, rerun all the tests, only the failed tests, snapshots, which we'll talk about uh, later. Filter by file name or filter by a particular uh, test name if you just want, if you're just working on like one particular thing and you only want that to run. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, um, with out of the box, the one major difference between um, by test and just is that out of the uh, box, what well, you create them or Oh, okay, 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 I'm getting started. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you got the math here. Mm hmm. You're exporting all of this. Actually, come to me. Follow me along here. Mm -hmm. There you got it. So here we got is uh, all of this, particularly functions. So subtract, multiply, divide, sum, and average. Pretty simple stuff, bro. <laughs> Pretty simple stuff. And the test here. Uh, but uh, the test 
are. Wait, why are you looking at me? Example test, yes. Example test, yes. Like this. Hey, it should work. Expected true to be true. Expected true to be told. Uh, words when returning a promise. Expect this uh, should fail not to be totally not the same. And then done. Mm -hmm. In this one. That you can also use this uh, to run your test. Uh, on the, okay, on the vellum. Or on the, I don't know. Looks like just to you. Because uh, you've used just. Yep, it does look like just. Um, one thing to note is that it drops into this watch mode automatically uh, as soon as you run the test. Uh, you can type in Q to leave that, or you can just hit Control C like everything in the terminal. You can hit H for a bunch of options that we'll kind of talk a little bit about later. But you can run, rerun all the tests, only the failed tests, snapshots, which we'll talk about uh, later. Filter by file name or filter by a particular uh, test name if you just want if you're just working on like one particular thing and you only want that to run. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, um, with out of the box, the one major difference between um, Vitest and Jest is that out of the box, you need to import the various things that you're using. So like describe, expect, test, it, so on and so forth. If you hate that, or if you're migrating from Jest and you don't want to do that, you can literally, um, for your test suite, go in here and say globals true. And then all of those things will now just be globally available like they are in Jest. Uh, great if you're migrating. Uh, great if you just don't want to uh, import those things all the time. Both are totally uh, fine with me. Um, there will be reasons why we have to have them globally available later, particularly why I bring this up now, is particularly when it comes to like, remember I said like you can just use like third party extensions that are meant for Jest? Well, there's certain things that they are expecting, unintended pun. Um, but yeah, so if you want them globally available, that's how that works, and you can see it right then and there. Awesome. And so we've got all of this kind of in place. You can see some of these tests. Um, one of the questions that will probably come up is, what is the difference between it and test? Nothing. Oh, it's Nothing. because this is... Uh, which one should you use? I, I don't care. How you can use uh, which one do I use? Like, I would love to tell you that my rule is if it's in a describe block, I use it. And if it's outside, I use test. But that's not even true. If I find myself writing sentences that start with it in the test description, then I will use it. And if I find myself hating that, uh, I will use test. They are the same thing. They, they're no different. Um, cool. One other thing you see is like, you know, true to be true, cool. Um, then there's not to be, which is does not equal. Um, you can also expect that a test fails, right? So this this is like uh, uh, opposite day, right? Where this test only passes if it fails. There are reasons why that will come in handy at certain points, um, which I'll say now, and then there's entire slides dedicated to this later, but I'll say now which is, and I said this before, a test passes when it does not fail, right? And so if, for instance, like you completely commented this out, um, well, that one still fails. That was a bad example. This one, it still passes, right? And because that's under the hood how a test suite works, which is if this is not the case, it throws an error, right? And that's what fails the test. The absence of a um, failure is passing. There are some times when we get to like component testing and like browser testing, you know, integration testing, if you will, where that's great because it's like, hey, go find these buttons and click them. If you found them all, do I need to expect anything at the end? I can, but like you found them all versus if that button wasn't on the page or that like div wasn't there or something along those lines and you blew up and failed the test, like cool, right? Like sometimes like the absence of a failure is all I need for it to pass, but um, sometimes we need to fail a test to make sure that like they are actually testing the thing that we want or they're just passing by accident, you know? Um, so dot fails or throwing it not in there sometimes it's helpful just to make sure that we don't have a false positive. Um, one of the nice things about my test is I don't even have to have a section. We have like a minor section on like edge cases, but I don't have a section of like, how do you deal with asynchronous code? Um, like if it uh, returns a promise, like it all just works, you use async await functions. Living in 2023 or whenever you have to be watching this post 2023 is great uh, because async is not nearly as hard as it was when I was a kid. Um, and so you can use async await functions. The one difference I noticed is that like a lot of older testing frameworks will let you put done in here. 
Mm -hmm. and then call it like when your callback was done to say that the test is completed. Uh, Jest doesn't support that. It actually takes a different argument in there. Uh, if you really had a bunch of callbacks, you probably want to give yourself some kind of abstraction like this. Uh, that said, I wrote this test for this workshop. This is not a thing that I've ever actually come across in the wild, but I also like don't have to deal with like old callback code. I mostly have promises to work with. Mark? Is there a reason to use byte test over Jest if you're already if you're not already using Byte. I know Byte test works better with the ES modules. I mean, yeah, that is basically the answer. I would say that my heuristic is like, so for instance, Jess comes built in to create React app, right? Um, which I understand is no longer uh, the canonical way to install React, but like, let's not get into that right now. Um, I will use Jess if it's there. Like, I would say that if you're using React app and you're using Jess, that's totally cool. If you're using Byte, like, it makes sense to use Byte test. They are in only tiny ways different. Um, I think that Byte is faster. Right. Um, for us, I work these days on marketing side, a bunch of other sites of React, but like the core application is Svelte, which uses Byte. So like originally we used Jest, and then I was fighting with CommonJS versus ES, uh, ES modules, and I was done fighting with that, so I migrated it. But that migration also took me like 90 minutes. Right. Like um, it did not take all that long. Um, so yeah. It. I would say that there's like if you're using like Webpack and using like Jest already, I think that's totally fine. Right. If you're not, and you're using Byte, well, yeah, having something that integrates with Byte makes more sense. Allegedly, it's faster, but that's always like, that could change next week. Um, there's also uh, run if and skip if, which will take some kind of condition and will do what you think it does um, in those situations. Um, generally speaking, I would say that these are probably a little bit more useful for the like node developers yeah, among us who might have to like deal with some of the intricacies of like running on Windows, right? Um, I you know like generally speaking, they're here. You might need them one day. Uh, you know like I build my application like for both you know a SaaS platform and open source. So like there's a world where maybe I will need one of these one day. They are here for you. They are there. Uh, but generally speaking, um, you there you probably don't need them. Cool. Um, like I said, like you'll notice that like it will run basically all the tests in a folder. Uh, out of the box, it is looking for anything with .test, .ts. You can change that to .spec. You can change it to whatever you want. Uh, there's like you can give it a bunch of pattern matches for include and exclude. I will use that like to dramatic effect to like skip solutions if I want to or something along those lines, um, or like have a different you know configuration working for the spell app. But like generally speaking, um, it will run everything with .test. Dot .ts or anything in an underscore underscore test underscore underscore directory. Um, if you want my personal opinion, because you asked, um, or somebody was about to, uh, I think there are two schools of thought, like have one test directory where you put in all your tests that are like divorced from the like implementation. I am a big fan of whatever that file name is, dot .ts, that file name, dot .test, dot .ts. Yeah, there is two, right? two um, schools of thought. And just immediately having it right next to the same file, I don't want to traverse the file system. You have now things. put all I your tests right under the test folders? Or doing that, right? Just a few. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that that'll be all for this video. Take care.